I'm really delighted to introduce Climate Resilience Hub Development in Westchester County, the final group. Um, we'll take five minutes for questions after the presentation, and we have a fabulous poster session following. Priya. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? So I'm here representing the Westchester Climate Crisis Task Force Sustainable Development Capstone Project Group. Um, our clients approached us way back in September, and they were very interested in doing a project on resiliency in Westchester County, which had had a 10-year gap in its last climate crisis uh, report, and so the data was really far behind. Um, so we all know that climate change can act as a threat multiplier and make certain things uh, it, it can exacerbate certain conditions in different areas, and the goal of a resilience hub is to mitigate excessive damage in, uh, that come along with these exacerbated conditions. So what we wanted to figure out was, what is the best path towards developing a community resilience hub in Westchester County? Um, and we decided to ultimately go with Mount Vernon as a case study site. So our project approach was five-pronged. We first do a literature review to better understand what a resilience hub entails. We did a site selection and spatial analysis using GIS of Westchester County to determine which location we should use. Um, we did a bottom-up snowball and SWOT analysis of different interviews. So we went into Mount Vernon itself and talked to community leaders and members about their concerns. And then we analyzed them for um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats in Mount Vernon. So before we can delve into what a resilience hub is, we have to understand what vulnerability is. And vulnerability lies at the intersection of health, environment, and socioeconomics. And these different factors are different in different places, and thus each community has its own unique vulnerabilities to hazards. One way to combat, pardon me, one way to combat vulnerability is through community resilience which involves these nine characteristics. The ones that we focused on for Mount Vernon specifically tended to be leadership, resources, local knowledge, and communication. A resilience hub works, and a resilience hub is kind of like a vehicle through which we can achieve community resilience, and it works before, during, and after climate disasters in order to better prepare the people, and it provides knowledge and services and resources during these times not just during, but also before and after. So it's meant to be a way to increase bonds in the community. So in choosing our vulnerability factor, um, in choosing our site, we looked at these three vulnerability factors and gathered census tract data to figure out which space we will be analyzing in Mount Vernon. For environmental factors, we looked at the heat and urbanacity index in Westchester County, and we looked at the floodplain in Westchester County. For health factors, uh, this was the most challenging uh, factor to look at because the only thing we could find was life expectancy data. There wasn't much that existed on such a small scale level in terms of census data, but we ended up using life expectancy. And then for socioeconomic status, we looked at the 15 socioeconomic factors that the CDC has determined are necessary uh, in determining vulnerability in different communities. And this is the map that our lovely project manager was able to create. And the darker red areas are areas that are more vulnerable in Westchester County. And the lighter areas are areas that are le less vulnerable. So as you can see, um, Mount Vernon is the area on the right. There are certain light areas and certain dark areas that are a product of redlining back in the 50s. So it is definitely not just um, heat factors or flood factors that can contribute to community vulnerability, but also factors such as uh, gender, socioeconomic, sta uh, socioeconomic status. But specifically in socioeconomic status, we ultimately decided to go with Mount Vernon because it was uh, disparately African American in population, and race is one of the key so uh, socioeconomic. Excuse me. Race is one of the key social determinants of health, and we know that um, an area that is more low income, that is more um, black and Latino tends to have worse resources available to them. And that's why we ended up going with Mount Vernon as opposed to Yonkers, which was another very dark red site, along with the fact that the population density was 15,000 people per square mile. Mount Vernon is only four square miles, where in Westchester, the average was about 2,000 per square mile. And on top of that, even though the median income for Westchester County as a whole was almost double. The median gross, excuse me, the median gross monthly rent in Mount Vernon was 
only $200 less, which means that this community is not only facing challenges of health and environment, but their socioeconomic challenges are great in terms of housing as well. So in terms of our approach, we started off doing a bottom-up interview approach, and we went into Mount Vernon uh, multiple times to interview community leaders there. Um, on the right, you see us with the youth shelter of Mount Vernon. Um, they're an NGO that works to um, rehabilitate uh, youth who are about to be incarcerated and prevent them from being incarcerated in the first place to better their opportunities later on. Um, we even spoke with council people. We spoke to the Department of Parks and Rec, the Department of Planning. All in all, we had approximately 17 interviews that we did, uh, the majority of were which Mount Vernon community residents and members and leaders, and then some also with academics such as Andrew Refkin and Ms. Malgosia. So our interviews, uh, we also did a field work analysis of Mount Vernon. Those are some photos we took. And even though Mount Vernon has a really robust transport hub, it's right above the Bronx. It's near two subway lines, three Metro North stations, and has a variety of buses. There is still such a lack of investment in the community, even though it could be such a hot spot. Um, there's a lack of fresh food, which is being combated by the fresh market, but it's mostly comprised of bodegas. And uh, we noticed that there was a church on every corner, and the, the statistic is that Mount Vernon supposedly has 700 churches within its small four square mile location. So in terms of our finding, we use the framework of a resilience hub and its goals in order to lay out our findings. So a resilience hub helps in planning for, responding to, and recovering from natural disasters. And of course, this is unique in each community because once again, each community is unique. So in Mount Vernon, we saw that in terms of planning for uh, planning for climate hazards, there were small, and since it's so small and there are strong community networks, especially through these churches, people do know each other and they do communicate, but we noticed that first of all, there was a large exclusion of the youth. They weren't really being invested in, there weren't really much youth groups. And on top of that, there weren't any climate or sustainability oriented initiatives or groups in Mount Vernon at all, um, because people were more focused on their immediate needs and worries um, pertaining to housing and food and education, and they weren't really thinking about climate at all. Um, we know that local knowledge, thus local knowledge, is also kind of in the negatives because people weren't really aware that climate change was happening, but we did notice that they were aware of more flooding and how difficult it was certain during things like Sandy and things of that nature, but it didn't link in their mind to climate change, so local knowledge was low. And in terms of communication, it was also quite poor because there were different community uh, organizations such as Park and Rec, Department of Planning, Boys and Girls Club, and whatnot, and they didn't really communicate with each other. Even the 700 churches, they all existed as separate entities. They weren't working together to try and build a strong community in Mount Vernon. In terms of responding to a disaster, uh, when we look at services and programs, which is our resources, um, Mount Vernon has many different programs uh, that are in the county, um, sorry, in the the city, including uh, something like United Tenants, which works with um, people who are struggling to pay their rent and helping them fight eviction. But a lot of people aren't aware that these services exist. So even though the services are there, if people don't know they're there and don't use them, then the services aren't really helpful. Another issue with services is that people aren't um, evaluating them, so we don't know if they're being effective. And in terms of immediate emergency planning and governance and leadership, it's quite poor in Mount Vernon as there is really no action plan for what happens if there's another flood, if there's another Sandy, if there's another climate disaster. Um, and if short-term planning isn't there, then of course responding to, I mean recovering from, the long-term planning isn't there either. People are so concerned about their immediate needs that they're not looking at long-term needs. And this is especially true for climate change where at least with education, you can kind of worry about immediate or housing immediate and it's harder to focus on long-term, but with climate change, there is no immediate and there is no long-term. And economic investment is quite poor in Mount Vernon, which is another reason we chose it as opposed to Yonkers, because Yonkers just had, um, uh, it's having a television and movie studio being built there within the next 10 years, and there's nothing like that in Mount Vernon. Um, and of course, the economic investment isn't really happening because one of the overarching issues in Mount Vernon is corruption, and there have been millions of dollars lost within the past decade. Um, by mayor, mayoral candidates and people having too many fingers and too many pies. 
Um, and of course, this lack of overall preparedness, and there's a heavy focus on social stressors as opposed to environmental stressors without realizing that those two may be more connected and that a climate threat can pose um, great challenges in social um, well-being as well. So one way that we are trying to bridge this resource gap, since we couldn't actually build a physical resilience hub within our three months tenure, even though that would have been lovely, what we ended up doing is we're making an online resilience hub almost and doing using a GIS to make a story map of all the different um, resources available in Mount Vernon. And this will be uh, both online and also printed and distributed at the soup kitchens, the libraries and schools, so that those without internet access and who aren't internet savvy can still access knowledge of these resources. The resources will include health resources, um, food resources, recreation, environmental, education. So if you're having trouble with um, paying your rent, then United Tenants is on here. If you're having trouble filling your belly, then all the soup kitchens that we were able to find are on here. And our ultimate goal is to make this resilience hub not only part of the Westchester website, but something that people in the community themselves can add to. It's because we're only, we're interlopers, we're here for a few months. They know their communities, I'm sure they know their resources. And if they can add them, then it could help other people in their community, it could build networks, and it could help a lot when climate change strikes even further. So that was us, thank you so much. And uh, any questions? Can I uh, pose a question, Joyce? Great job. Can I start? Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks. Great presentation. I have a question that's maybe a little narrow, but sort of re reflects the headspace I'm in as a climate scientist, but I think also something that's relevant right now in the university. From your perspective, is, is much more climate research specifically, climate science, a high priority for a project like this? Or as a counter argument, um, are the types of innovations you described, maybe more on the social vulnerability, lack of capacity side, possibly coupled with a little more qualitative description of the climate risks? For example, more floods needed. So it's just sort of open with, is climate research a priority here? Or downscaling of climate information? Or I guess that, that's a question to the group. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Uh, I think for this type of project at the community level, people seem to respond more to the term resilience than uh, climate change, and resilience as a concept that can tackle environmental and social issues. So of course I think in the background there should be some climate science research, research to see exactly how to retrofit buildings, how uh, Mount Vernon specifically is vulnerable, but at the same time uh, resilience uh, and more community-based work needs to be like the, the face of such projects, I think. And also in addition to that, um, whenever we talk to community members, they did express um, their doubts on um, how climate science is going to help them before they solve many of their problems, such as poverty, hunger that is going on in the community. So for example, we talked to the soup kitchen um, director, and he expressed that the community does not really care about the climate science um, because they are struggling with day-to-day -day problems. So um, initially, we realized that we first need to address the social problems and then focus on the climate uh, issues to prevent long-term damage to the community. Sorry, and one other thing was that not only Oh, sorry to be obnoxious. <laughs> uh, one other thing was that um, when we were interviewing Malgosia, uh, what, I so feel so bad. Yes, and she was absolutely lovely, and she's doing work in uh, Staten Island, I believe, uh, in similar capacity. Rockway Beach on, in a similar capacity, and people do notice that things are going wrong environmentally. They notice that it's hot. They notice that it's flooding. It's just climate change isn't what's on the mind. It's other things. Um, at the same time, these because vulnerability is at an intersection, socioeconomic, health, and environment, they all interact to amplify the effects of each other. So if climate goes wrong and people get sick, then that's a health issue. And if you get sick and you can't go to work and you can't pay your bills, that's a socioeconomic issue. So it's this synthesis that's important and recognizing that through strong ties and resources, the community can be stronger to all three. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for the great presentation. So Lyme disease is prevalent in Westchester County and increasing and has a link with um, mm. climate change. Mm. It's not a, Lyme disease is not a disaster like floods or storms, but certainly is uh, related to climate. So did you find any awareness about Lyme disease or uh, resources for people uh, related to Lyme disease or other infectious diseases? Um, so we kind of focused on Mount Vernon as our case study, and that's a very urban population. It's very dense. Um, so we didn't really look into Lyme disease at all. Um, but I'm sure if someone had Lyme disease, they could look at health resources and maybe try and find someone to help them and where they can go, like clinics and like even information on health care you'd need if you had Lyme disease. So maybe that, yeah. We didn't specifically address that, though. Um, so when talking to a lot of the community leaders, uh, land disease was definitely not something that was in their mind um, because their issues, uh, there was always other issues that were more pressing, even though Lyme disease is important, but uh, a lot of the issues that they were focusing on was more kind of the socioeconomic issues um, that are more, more prevalent, we're more seen day to day. So Lyme disease is not an issue that was a daily uh, issue, so. And, and also, uh, there's not a hospital in Mount Vernon, which is bonkers. If people want to, if someone is pregnant and they're about to give labor, they have to go out of Mount Vernon to have their child. So uh, forget, forget even like preventative care to maternal needs. There's no, uh, it's, and another thing with health, you saw there was only the life expectancy data. So the data is incredibly lacking in Mount Vernon. And I know that uh, one of the clinics was attempting to give out a survey um, as of last year in a questionnaire about how people are doing in terms of even their mental health and what prevents them from going to the doctor. Is it that they can't afford their bus fare if they go to the doctors and things of that nature? So it's, I think Mount Vernon as a whole is completely lacking in uh, medical services that will be more needed when um, climate change occurs and everything else. And one more thing, the, the, the data we found is usually for health is only available at a at a county level, so finding data for census tract level is uh, has a lot of issues with uh, privacy and uh, hospitals releasing data. So th that's another reason why there wasn't any data available. Um, so I just had a quick question, but how much of the community is like a commuter community that works in New York versus like living there? And how did you guys kind of incorporate that into thinking about like community engagement? Uh, so, the, so we mostly talk to community leaders and not directly to the community, but uh, uh, so these were people who were um, uh, serving really the community living in Mount Vernon, uh, those, the, the youth, the elderly, etc. But uh, the councilwoman really raised gentrification as a big issue in Mount Vernon and uh, an increasing amount of people that come uh, just sleep in Mount Vernon and then go work in the city because the rent are slightly less than in the rest of the city. Uh, and that's a big problem because uh, it displaces further vulnerable uh, populations. And also it, um, the, the people that live in Mount Vernon contribute to like the cultural diversity and the identity and having just people that sleep there and not contribute is a big problem as they're already facing issues with social cohesion. Adding on to the culture, um, P. Diddy's from Mount Vernon and Nina Simone's from Mount Vernon and Mount Vernon has like a rich history of, um, I think basketball is the big thing, so people invest in basketball because they think that it's the most viable option for the youth even though it's not necessarily sustainable. But I think the highest, um, one of the stats we were told is like there's just such a high concentration in the NBA of people who are, um, who are part of the NBA who come from Mount Vernon. So it's like a star basketball school and scouters come and recruiters come. But that that, that isn't, that's inherently Mount Vernon and its resilience in, that is displayed ever since, and, and we saw this map. This map is, we can literally name, there's a fountain. You see that on the top right corner, there's that really light pale spot. There's a fountain right there. And when we drive past a fountain, all of a sudden it's a completely different area. It's called Fleetwood. It's very high income. And that's all because of, that's all because of redlining. And, 
the fact that this community, those really deep red spots, were able to produce so much and contribute so much to culture, even with all the challenges they faced, if people are just invested in, then they could do so much. Yeah. Uh, and sorry, in terms of resiliency hub, so um, we try to kind of focus our interviews on uh, people who could actually make a resiliency hub viable. And a lot of the people that we interviewed actually do not live in Mount Vernon. They commute inside to work in these communities. Uh, usually the only people that live there were the people from, from the city council or the parks and rec. Um, yeah, but most of the people that worked with like uh, the Boys and Girls Club or other kinds of organizations like that that were more private were definitely coming in from other places. Introduce Lisa Dale. Hi, thanks. I just wanted to introduce uh, and give some context for the posters that you see around the edge of the room. This is from my qualitative research methods for the social sciences class. We had 13 students each doing individual research projects and part of their uh, final presentation of their research is to create these posters. So they're gonna stick around for the next 45 minutes or so and be standing next to their posters and so we encourage you to come take a look and chat with them about what they did. Thanks so much. And before we start the posters, thank you so much to the students. How many of you are graduating this semester? Excellent. Congratulations. A job well done. I think what impressed me the most was the teamwork that you did this semester. You collaborated. You trusted each other. You got the work done on time. And um, I really want to thank my colleague Bradley Horton for his great introduction. This is the first semester I am teaching workshop. And I admit at first I was a little daunted by the 45-page syllabus. Radley sent it to me this summer. I thought, oh no. <laughs> but I have to say I want to recognize the work that you've done with Stuart Gaffin um, to make this incredible you know, work that you've done possible. Um, because really, I've seen some of the finest teamwork that I've ever seen for 20 years of teaching in these groups. And um, I think those skills will carry over very, very well into your professional life. So for those graduating, congratulations. It really is your capstone. And for those doing another semester, congratulations too. I also want to thank Jason and Ruth for your leadership in the program. This was a really great semester. Thank you, and please stay for the poster sessions. Thank you. 